session. So I want to talk about 
fabrication. How do you make the little thing? And where is the history of it? You Google now, you get a billion hits, which is appropriate because it ain't nothing but one over a billion. It's just a number or a modifier. I, got, I usually bring nano objects. It's been kind of hectic the last week. But I usually bring a brick, uh, 12 people, and a small cup of coffee. So in terms of nano objects, which one is the nano object to the USS Nimitz? I used to bring money, by the way, but a billion dollars is not very impressive anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the Nimitz is. So the one, one billion, the, any sailors here, anybody who has military experience? Talk to a sailor, what is the, uh, what is the military run on any diesel fuel it is? Coffee. Obviously no military fuel. So a cup of coffee is one, one billionth of the Nimitz. How about money, by the way? What's one billionth of the cost of the Nimitz? Five bucks. How about the Great Pyramid of Giza? If we have a brick and 13 people left over, which one is one one billionth of the, 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 uh, the Khufu Pyramid? The brick, absolutely. Yeah. One, a billion bricks, roughly. And now, so now we're trying to figure out what is a billion times 13, what did I say, 13, 18 people? Any, any ancient object that is a billion times the size and the weight of about 15 people? You can see it from space. Very small well China. So you take 13, 14, 15 people, you multiply it by a billion, you've got the great wall. In terms of distance, what is a nano wall? A quarter inch or 100 feet? Quarter inch. So, so those are just some nano objects. I like to throw them out. As I said, money used to be valuable, but it isn't anymore. A lot of nanotechnology used to be called things that dealt with in our day-to-day -day. chemistry, biology. A lot of it's been grabbed around nanotechnology because in 1998, President Clinton says nano is the future. Everything what used to be biology became nano. Everything what used to be chemistry became nano. Uh, a lot of it is driven now by information technology and this ability to acquire massive amounts of information, sift through it, and get something relevant in a short amount of time. That's causing significant social changes, and I want to spend one of my pillars of the the talk talking about the social implications of this technology, not just what it's doing to manufacturing or to the financial base, what it's doing to people. All right? uh, I assert that you plus your smartphone is a different biological entity than you. You can mull that over for a while. <laughs> but it's changing the way we live, right? It used to be just you. You had your thoughts, your ideas, your concepts. Now you have your thoughts, your ideas, your concepts, and every fact that's ever been discovered by the human species over the last 6,000 years, and it's there at your fingertips. Plus you know where you are. Some of us don't all the time. <laughs> plus you know where you're going. Plus you know where the best pizza is within a mile, right? So you are now a much more competent biological individual, so you ain't the same thing you were if the batteries run out. So think about that. But as I said, it changes the way we live, work, play, the way we deal with finance. We no longer talk about investing a few dollars in building a ship and sailing somewhere. We're talking about global investments on the order of billions of the largest uh, commercial product or commercial industry going, constant surveillance, facial recognition, GPS monitoring. So again, it's affecting every aspect of our life. The security bus side is interesting. Anyone know what London 73 means? If you are in London, if you leave your hotel and you go to lunch and then you go back to your hotel, how many times have you had your picture taken and compared to every known terrorist on earth? How many times? 73 times. And the average tourist going to lunch in London has been, has been compared with known terrorists 73 times. If you commute to work in London, commute to work, go to work, take the trolley or the, what's it called, the tram? The tube. Tube. Take the tube. Get off, go to work, walk around, go to lunch, etc. 400 times you've had your picture taken and compared with every known terrorist. This is interesting. In addition to manufacturing and coding, there are all kinds of implications. And again, I just want that to be uh, thrown out there for your reflection. Uh, if you're looking at the IT careers, you can imagine this. And this is the cloud. You can imagine inexpensive, precise sensors and actuators, real time, wireless, tireless, monitoring and adjusting everywhere everything. It does it to your car and we don't mind. It's doing it now. I'm just doing something with my thumb and automatically things happen. Okay, but that's it. That's our robust package. And notice when I say robust, I mean you can swallow it. Okay, sensors and actuators measuring everything. Energy harvesting. You can use the chemicals in your blood to 
can generate electricity. That electricity can power a measuring device that measures something. That can be sifted by a computer analyzed, juggled around, sent to a saw device, data transmitted out, and your doctor in Stanford, California can look at that and say, maybe you better take a candy bar. You're not feeling very good today. Okay? This is all done. You can put this robust package in your body, you can put it on a volcano. Okay? That's the history. And if you're going to need IT folks, I imagine you folks are IT folks. Hey, you want a job? Figure out how to do that. <laughs> do something. And, and the reason I throw all these things out is because the lab that I work in is doing all of these things. Uh, CNSE is doing a lot of that and a lot of this, and we do the fundamental, and that's why we tend to complement one another. If you look at New York State, there's an incredible distributed intelligence working with optics, working with mechanics, working with MEMS, working with bioelectronics, etc. And developing all these different things. But again, it's going to be important to do this. You can throw this in a cesspool and monitor the way pollutants in the environment are being cleaned up. They're doing this in Syracuse. They're trying to clean up uh, Lake Onondaga. They just need in-site measurement devices looking at uh, metals contamination, various other things. And uh, it's a great way to do something. Again, a generic kind of thing that is fully automated, autonomous, self-powered, etc. And it does all those things. Uh, so the, the four pillars that I want to talk about in terms of, well, one is really going to be technology and fabrication. And I hope to spend most of the time talking about what we've done for other folks in that area, what kinds of devices we can make, and these applications are going to be very important. So that's going to be roughly uh, half the process. And then I want to talk about the SEI issues, because from a fundamental point of view, we want to examine uh, how technology affects society and how it impacts things like ethics. Again, ancient technologies. Your grandparents might have talked about them. Okay, stimulating re research and reflection. I ask the community that I know and the community I don't know, Give me one word that describes nanotech's impact over the next 20 years. So I'm going to ask you same thing. While you're thinking about it, I'd like to talk about nanotech's impact over the last how many years? How many? Let's take a guess. How many? Thousands. Two thousand years. Yeah. So nanotech's impact. Well, this is the Lycurgus cup. Uh, you may, some of you may know it. It's a cup that uh, represents the beginning of nanotechnology. Nanotechnology was invented. 2,000 years ago by a person named Lycurgus, who was an ancient Greek mythological king. So, you know, I'm making this up. So Lycurgus was a mythological Greek king who had an argument with the wine god. The wine god had an enforcer. Any idea who the wine god's enforcer was? The grapevine. Uh, the grapevine's <laughs> name is Ambrosia. She's the enforcer for the wine god. And as she's dragging Lycurgus down to hell for his insubordination, Lycurgus says the world must know of my pain. The world must know of this injustice. So he invented nanotechnology to display that. You don't believe any of these people. <laughs> he invented nanotechnology. This is the first example of nanotechnology. Uh, so what's happening? When the light is reflecting off the cup, it looks green. When the light is behind the cup and going through it, it looks red. So you all, you all know what these are. These things are. These are scattering centers. These are gold and silver nanoparticles on the order of 8, 10, 12 nanometers. They sit inside the cup, and they they are slot filters. They, they filter and absorb and reflect radiation at different wavelengths. And so that's when the radiation hits it, it looks green. And that's when the radiation goes through it, it looks red. So nanotechnology was invented 2,000 years ago by a king uh, who didn't exist. He was very held by a great mind. It's an interesting story. I wouldn't believe it either. So that, and for those of you who came in late, I want to give you sort of my credentials. They're pretty poor. I don't own a smartphone, cell phone, laptop. I don't own none of those things. Uh, but nevertheless, I work in technology. So again, you can evaluate the words. Don't look at me for an example. I'm, I'm not a very good one. Okay. What are your responses, by the way, to the question I just asked? What is nanotech's impact over the next 20 years? I mean, I just throw them out. I'll give you what some of the folks in the, the lab group say. Transformative. Transformative is a good one, yeah. A lot of people said that. Interestingly enough, the first example I heard from a, a group of nanotech geeks. So these are, again, folks who are in the community. First one was disappointment. Oh. Uh, this is for a person who is immersed in nanotechnology and has every gadget that I described a few minutes ago that I do not possess. He has them all. He has a laptop that has a side screen on it. So he is the technical nerd of the mall, and yet his first word was disappointment. Be careful. Uh, progress, fabulous. Uh, this is uh, the, the 
contribution to the fact that we might affect our food supplies, changing our environment, etc. Healthy is good. Devolution is another one. From a, this is from a young guy, not much older than you. And he has, he carries his cell phone everywhere he goes and answers it, which I think is two different things. Uh, but he said devolution. And, and we had interesting discussions about how uh, he is completely helpless without that. Uh, potential, I think, is the, the, the biggest word. That, that is the keystone of everyone's statement. The possibilities are immense, uh, we just have to do them. Semiconductor industry says the same thing it said for the last 50 years, eloquently, by the way. Smaller, faster, lighter, cheaper, better. And, and I'll leave the dollar sign off if that's the end goal. So, technology is pretty straightforward. Nanotech is what you want it to be. Uh, if anything, it used to be nano uh, from pants that don't stain. The Army has an active program now, a uh, very active program to generate underclothing that are good for 30 days. Not just 30 days, but 30 days in the field. And if you've ever been in the field with a military organization, you know that that's an extreme statement. Okay, 30 days in the field without changing them, and you are as fresh as a daisy on day 30. <laughs> <laughs> Those of us who've been in the field, we know that. But nevertheless, uh, so clothing and uh, coatings and various other things are, again, a strong uh, component of it. The DNA replication, this is the, the light curve. They were making stained glass 1,500 years ago, the great computers of Europe, and they were making it with these gold and silver nanoparticles. And if you get the right mixture, they will resonate and they will generate spectacular colors. This is what those of us in the field think of a nanometer. It's three or four or five layers of silicon and oxygen mixed together to form the gate of the transistor. Right now, in industry, in CNSE, on their 300 millimeter wafers, they're looking at 1.2 nanometers, 12 angstrom thick. <coughs> And that's a nanometer that is one of billion of a meter. If you take that and then back over 3,000 or 3.5 billion years, you get this. Uh, sort of, it culminated, or maybe not yet, but its present state of evolution is that thing you see up in the upper right. It went through mold and fungi, so you can see where our history is. Mold and fungi and various other things. Uh, some of them are very beautiful. Okay, so that's that. This gives us that. And this is the heart of the CNSE kind of production. We have very well controlled. You see, if these things are only 25 or 30 nanometers across, you really don't want a lot of dust or contamination in the air. But this is, see, the IT folks, what is this thing? Bifocus Simon, right off the shelf. There's nothing cool about it. But if you look at what IBM is doing right now in their, what is this, their 90 nanometer diet? I don't remember what, but it looks like that. The green is the insulator, and the red are the connectors. Uh, the red is sort of that. These are either a aluminum or gold wire transistors at the bottom, and you have this superstructure. Uh, okay, and that gives us this, which is fantastic, and it all comes from, just, I went past it too quickly. Our keynote speaker mentioned the first Bell Labs transistor, and that is it. So you all have to see that. That's one of my first take-home messages. You gotta see where it started, and that was 1947. Ten years later, Texas Instruments, or depending on who you want to believe, somebody invented a, uh, an integrated circuit. That's what it looked like on a piece of glass with some wires crudely soldered together, and that was the heart of all the things that we have. Right now, the standard is this 300 millimeter wafer, and I thought I'd bring you one to show you what it looked like. Um, I'm going to pass this around so you can take a look at it. Pass around a fluidic circuit as well. So you can pass that around. That's the, the heart of a fluidic circuit. And that is a 300 millimeter wafer. This is the state of art, the industry. You see the, the copperish color. That's because it's copper. They like copper as a higher level metal. Uh, and that is, I forget what the technology is, but the, the state of that art is what gives you somewhere in here there's a computer. As long as I have a few other things, do, do you mind if I pass these things around? Sure. Yeah, give you a sense of them. Uh, that, oh, that's the Odessa Montour High School. We, we make uh, school logos too. Don't tell the director. But. And this was public relations. I'm looking for a computer chip that's supposed to be something like that. These are just some examples of chips and technologies that uh, we engage in. So the beauty of it is that they're sort of portable. This one is interesting, and I'll talk about this a little later. So I can pass this around. Really what? 
<laughs> All right, there are some other things we can talk about later. I think we're going to have time later. Uh, so I wanted to, uh, just to get you. What is this? Oh, that is a, uh, that's actually a blood filter. If you look at that, I'll talk about that a little later. But those of you with young eyes, if you see a really thin line that passes from one side of the device to the other, that line is a filter. It's a mechanical filter. And it's actually set up to grab red blood cells or grab white blood cells and reject red blood cells. You want to sift out the red blood cells because the white have DNA. I'll talk about that later in the <laughs> Yeah, you have to get the blood in from the bottom. I'll decide to do it. So that's it. That's the technology. Uh, and again, you've seen all these slides. I don't want to dwell on these just to show you that the technology keeps going. But the interesting number is this. It's the last number. In 1970, they had a few transistors. It was running at a few kilohertz or a few megahertz. It cost a few hundred dollars. Today, you have giga and gigahertz, and it still costs a few hundred dollars. And that was Moore's Law. Well. So Gordon Moore in 1965 said, things get better. Roughly, you get twice the functionality every year or two. And that's essentially what he said. He wasn't talking about size. He was talking about capability. You could do twice as much. And it just sort of continued on. It started out as a, an observation. And he was first to admit that. Then it became a prediction. And now it's a law. And Intel advertises every six months you go on their website. And they say the world's first blank. You know, pick it. And clearly we're talking about Wi-Fi and smartphones. Uh, the semiconductor industry and things what need a screen is roughly a $2 trillion a year budget in a $60 trillion gross world product. So semiconductors and silicon and transistors, notice you're all thinking about jobs, you can get a piece of this. That's $2 trillion. Uh, and it's 3% of the gross world product. Uh, a lot of money involved and, and uh, an interesting opportunity. Right now, improvements are driven by scaling mostly. I agree there are a lot of sophisticated zips, but mostly it's technology by scaling. Better, getting better is still done by getting smaller. And uh, these are nice and pretty pictures. Uh, you can go in three jumps. You can go from what the human eye, well, a good young eye can see on A, which is a hair. You can snap a hair off, and if you're lucky, you can see it. Okay, and that's roughly 65 nanometers. That's a, that's a Slavic hair in case you're Bacteria on that scale, the red blood cells are about 10 micrometers. Uh, on the scale of bacteria, uh, you get this 100 angstrom line, and then you just jump by another factor of 100. So it doesn't take much to get you down to a atomic scale. The little things that are on the surface of the bacteria, any idea what they are? There was a book called Prey, and social ethical people talk about prey all the time. Uh, prey is where little nano robots suddenly decide that we taste good. <laughs> so people are worried about that. And that's actually a real possibility. I mean, one possibility when we start investigating the Ebola virus is that it could get out and contaminate a lot of people. The other possibility is that nanotechnology could run amok. And that's an interesting concept because it is a real fear. And so people worry about nanobots that are allowed to do things or able to do things. So when you look at that, you say, what is a little robot going to do when it suddenly decides we're good? Will it decide to eat us? The answer is yes, it will try. Keep in mind, those things have been around for three and a half billion years. Well, they're viruses. So the bacteriophage on the surface of the bacteria have been around for billions of years. They try to eat us. We develop defense mechanisms against them. And so there are ways of addressing it. So it's not, all hope is not lost, but we still have to be careful about it. And these are all some interesting, did you get these on the web? And again, I don't want to dwell on this. I want to concentrate on where we're going. You can actually make machine tools that are 25, 30, 40 microns. You can go down to single digit nanometers, and I always like to say nanotechnology is whatever you want it to be based on what technology you need. If you need a 5,000 nanometer device, that's all you want. You don't really have to push it down to single digit nanometers because it gets kind of expensive. A lot of people will say less than 100 is nanotechnology. I don't know. All I will say is that when you get down below, say, 50 or 100 or 150 nanometers, you're talking about art more than you're talking about science. Uh, you can go a lot smaller, you can talk about high energy physics. I wanted to reference that because when we talk about how small we can go, the first person who jumps out is Richard Feynman. And so in commemoration of his activities, we actually print, this is John Trifer, uh, he works at the lab. He printed the entire text of Richard Feynman's 1959 speech. I can imagine a system 
consumer physicists can go on and on and on, including Feynman's picture. And he did that in an area 20 microns squared. Now, you could make 10 of these on a cross section of your hair. That's how small. So you could now literally write on the head of a pen, and you can calculate. Somebody did it, and I don't remember the number, but they calculated the number of angels that could dance on the head of a pen, like 68,000 or something. But the angel was a certain thing. And uh, you can actually qualify that. So how small can we go? If you want to ask that fundamental question, how far can we go? I think Feynman would be pleased. Those of you who saw Nature Nanotech in February of 2012, they have a transistor that will work doing, this is all transistors do, by the way. There are a lot of them, and they work fast, but essentially you're saying yes, no. Today's Wednesday, today's not Wednesday. We had a good lunch, we had a bad lunch. We had, we had a delicious lunch. All right, so you, everything is options, everything is code, whatever you can do on a code. Now you have a transistor that is one atom in size. You can actually measure the energy levels changing by one atom. Um, so again, a lot of room at the bottom for a lot of activity. Unfortunately, as things get small, the cost goes up, and it goes up astronomically. And that's where the problem lies. The problem lies not in the concept. The problem lies in the marketing. How much can you make out of this, considering how much you have to spend in producing it? That's where it's all stuck, because you could essentially move atoms one by one, and you could build an entirely new material. You could build an entirely new structure. This has been demonstrated. The point is, does it pay to do it? And is it an interesting thing to do? In terms of the silicon bottom, right now, Silicon cannot hold more than, uh, I don't know, until 8, 10, 12 nanometers. They've proven that you can do a 10 nanometer silicon transistor. That's been demonstrated. But smaller than that, it gets really sketchy because silicon is not silicon when it's only 3 nanometers wide. The electron doesn't even know there's silicon there, so it can't possibly be influenced by the electric field. Uh, in fact, Philip Wong is a researcher from IBM on the fundamental level of technology, and he talked about the biological bottom, which again, if you say, is the ultimate development of biology, which would be where? Between our ears, right? You would argue that the human brain is, maybe would you argue? Would you not argue? If you look at the culmination of biology, anyway, so I made a little chart to compare. Right now, your microprocessor is, I don't know, square inch, give or take, got a gigahertz and gigaflops and whatever. Runs about 40 watts, costs give or take $1,000. Well, I agree, but it's sort of the state of the art. If you compare that to your brain, it's a quarter of a cubic foot. It's got tens of millions of gigahertz equivalent speed, and it's running 10 to the 17th fuzzy floating point operations a second. If you look at this, this is 10 to the 10. So your brain has 10 million times as many switching and decision making points as the electronic device. It runs about 10 watts, and you can decide what you can <laughs> but the point is, if you're looking at the structure of the challenge between the silicon and the biological life form, the silicon life form is kind of still second place. The carbon life form is still doing okay. To make a silicon brain, to make a computer chip that has anything near the equivalent complexity and sophistication of your brain, you need all these figures of merit. It would take 100,000 watts to run it. $10 million per chip at laser fabrication rates, and it would cover 900 square feet. So a chip that has the complexity of your brain would be as big as this room or bigger. It's an interesting comparison. Again, I'm going to the genesis of technology. In the beginning, there was the brain. Maybe in the end. So you can manipulate matter on a scale of nanometers, and the question is, what is the outcome? So when we talk about the promise, it's everything. Uh, there is an interesting approach to looking at this, and we have now gotten into a situation where the technologists are hiring uh, the uh, social scientists to analyze what we're doing with the eye to maybe it's the right thing and maybe it's not. And this is obviously in light of past dubious achievements. So the uh, CNF and the, the uh, NNIN, and I'll talk about where, where I work and the oversight of it, uh, but the nanotechnology gives you the promise of a brave new world, but it also gives you the flip side. And one has to look at both sides just in case. And uh, anyway, you could have uh, some excellent activity that we need to evaluate. If you take these and say, what's the flip side? The answer is, well, if you change nature to grow food anywhere you want, all that you want, you're changing nature. And now food ain't food no more. The standard statement, if you go to the food gurus, they will tell you that 93 to 96% of the things you buy in supermarkets are not food anymore. They are food products. 
that have been modified, homogenized, pasteurized, transformed, etc., into something that not necessarily is still food, but it can be eaten. Uh, again, is that really food? Is that a good or a bad? If you take all the energy you want in the world, you say energy is free, you can do anything you want with it. Well, what happens if you don't control it? You can have energy accidents, which we've had a few recently, and they become messy. You can also have the strongest weapons, right? And then you start to argue over who gets access to these infinite weapons. So you see, social scientists are having a field day with this, and rightfully so, because we need to examine all these different activities. Individualized medicine is great, because is the trial over yet? Right? We can talk about individual treatment, meaning that you do something in a narrow way to treat an affliction and make you back to normal. But what happens if you are normal and you want to run faster? Then you're talking enhancement. Who's on trial for something to do with hitting the baseball further than other people? I don't remember the details, but, okay? Enhancement, and if you keep going further, even if it becomes legal if you're talking about enhancement, you're now talking about something called evolution, or as some, one of my associates would say, devolution. You're changing what we are. Uh, again, good, bad, and different, this is not my position to say. What I'm saying is you need to reflect on it. Uh, if you have a completely connected society, you have a complete loss of individuality. Can anyone say Borg? Does anyone know what Borg is, right? Do you know the Borg? Yeah. No, the Borg. Yeah. Star Trek. Star Trek. Ah, every plate paper. This is, I'm telling you, your homework is to find Star Trek, Deep Space Nine, or whatever, look up the cube, Borg, find that episode. You two must have it. This so, so when, you, when you are completely connected to society, do you completely lose your individuality? I mentioned that I would talk about that. I don't want to be suspicious, and I don't want to cause so man in a revolution. It was interesting that in Boston, if you go to Faneuil Hall, which is where they fomented the revolution, uh, I asked the person, can you just go in and talk? He says, no, there are three things you can't do in Faneuil Hall. Uh, one is to face the property. Two is get married. And the third is to foment the revolution. You're not allowed to talk about it. OK, but the point is that uh, you do lose privacy and individuality. And again, that's something social upheaval. And as I said, there are a lot of folks who do not have computers, and will there be a conflict, the inevitable conflict, between them, what got them, and what want? Uh, I do not know. Back past technologies have had problems, and so we want to examine it. So this is it, N-N-I-N-S-E-I, if you're interested in looking at that aspect of it. Uh, the mantra is stimulating research and reflection. So the National Nanotechnology Infrastructure Network stimulates research, and the SEI component of it. I talk to a lot of school food folks and uh, groups, and even if you're not interested in technology, and I know uh, all of you are, but even if you're not, you have to vote on this. That's the power of the, the voting booth. Is it right for the government? Is it right for individual businesses? Is it right for folks to engage in certain activities? If it influences society, society has to say. And uh, again, that's my sort of mind of the for the SEI. Uh, early focus is where it belongs on the environment and on people, and again, if you look at past environmental problems, they just uh, Fabrication, I want to go through very quickly. Again, even though I have a lot of information, I wanted to uh, uh, tailor the audience mainly to application. So uh, we have a lot of the educational activities going on, and they cross many boundaries. Uh, they are, because of their nature, high-cost activities. That's why they tend to be concentrated. So you have them in the big cities, you have CNSE connected to the semiconductor, and as I said, you have the NIN, which is connected to the, the opposite of that, which is going to work. Uh, this is NNIN. And uh, we wanted to talk about how we get faculty involved. This is my job, so uh, I will talk later about it if you want to talk details. But it's a cohesive network of 14 sites spread around the country. Uh, the mission is to enable advances in science, engineering, and technology by offering access to standard statements. If you build it, they will come. And so we have all these sites, we have a lot of capabilities, and that's what I want to emphasize, not just the details of the 387 instruments, but I want to emphasize the capabilities and what they can turn out to be able to produce. So uh, a lot of public, a lot of outreach application. Uh, it is people, and I think that the fundamental heart of it is all technologies, all politics is local, all technology is people. Uh, and a lot of these things are actually going to talk, you can tell what they are, they are little tubes. These are nanoconstrictions and nanotubes that allow fluid to flow. That's a nano tip. It can be a writing instrument or a sensing instrument. That's a nano guitar. I have a few of those in this box, in fact. That's that around there. And 
so a lot of different applications. And everyone every day interacts with one of these, although you might not know why and how. I'll talk about that later as well. So the lab is pretty straightforward. It's a basic research lab. Almost none of the tools are automated. Almost none of the tools are 300 millimeter. We work with a wafer that's as big as your hand, only because it's easy to carry something that fits your hand rather than an 8 inch platter. So, or 12 inch platter. So everything is done on the one per, the two per, the couple and a handful sort of thing. And if you want one to work, you make a few hundred or a few thousand. And so somewhere in that mess, there's going to be one that works. Our lab is located on the Cornell campus. It's at the, at the bottom. This is the hall, these are all the buildings, the, uh, the different instruments. Again, the details of the instruments are kind of something we can pass over. What I want to talk about is capability. Uh, I mentioned we have a, a large population. Most of our folks come from a variety of different places. Uh, they come from business, they come from industry, they come from academia. There are independent folks who produce their product literally on their kitchen table. And one of our success stories was a person who started out working from his kitchen table with his household. Uh, some of them are big companies. You can see a few of them might be listed up there, uh, people who use us for one specific application. Uh, we have about seven or 800 people who come and do something annually. The population is in the thousands. The number of projects are in the thousands. The folks just come and go. Uh, we are used as a machine shop. We're a machine shop with an attitude. Uh, but we essentially <laughs> Whatever need you have from single digit nanometers all the way up to things as big as your hand. And again, that, that capability costs a lot of money, so it tends to be concentrated. These are some of the applications. And I want to emphasize that at the fundamental nanoscale level, things are not complicated. Sometimes things can be rather simple or rather sophisticated. This is just a bunch of holes in a substrate that has interesting quantum mechanical properties. I can talk about that. These are just a bunch of crystals, and they will hold charge. So nanocrystal memory and tends to have a long residence time, a lot longer than if you put memory in a capacitive charge. This is a laser. Uh, communication, light moves faster than electrons through various materials you can communicate with a larger bandwidth. So lasers are nice. This little thing out here is just a mirror. So lasers, mirrors, we're talking about the five simple machines, the seven simple machines, but they can translate into incredible sophistication. And I want to show you some examples <coughs> later. These are just two electrodes. But these two electrodes happen to be two or three nanometers apart. So there are interesting and sophisticated ways for taking macromolecules and pulling them so that one macromolecule lands across these electrodes. Then you can do something else, wash away the excess, and start to interrogate. That's how they make a single atom in the transistor, is by very carefully putting a molecule across here and putting one atom flip from energy state to energy state, and it can be regulated by uh, this is a diving board. It ain't nothing more than a diving board. It's simply a mechanical device that vibrates. If you look, you see this little dot at the end. There's a functionality there. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. So notice I've got photo. I've got mechanics. I've got opto. What did I say? Narrow bio photo MEMS. So that's MEMS. That's photo. Uh, there's bio. OK. This is, uh, again, does this look familiar to you? Maybe biologist. I want to get the biologist it's a neuron, it's a mouse neuron. And what we want to do is functionalized and textured surfaces can cause interesting things. Interestingly enough, just like the fake here in the, uh, in the market, the person can lay across the bed of nails, some people like certain environments. Some creatures like certain environments. It turns out the mouse neuron likes to be floating above the substrate because if it is, it can get nourished from the top and bottom. So the first thing it likes to do is sit on a bed of nails. If you have a functionalized and textured surface, you'll get some preferences. You can see there's a preference right there, there's a preference right there, there's a preference right here. And so the neuron will extend the axon, or the, uh, the nerve cell will extend the axons in certain directions. If you cut your nerve, your spinal cord, or damage anything in your brain, nerves will heal painfully and agonizingly slow. Anybody's ever had a nerve injury? If you could direct the axons, the nerves would knit faster. Right there is a Nobel Prize. So in terms of knitting nerves together at a higher level of higher frequency. And that is by, and then associated with that, we can take functionalized textured surfaces, we can take fluidic surfaces. I'm going to talk about a lot of application to biology and, and sort of interacting with this three and a half billion year evolution of biology. So these are just typical projects, but they uh, express several things. One is on a fundamental level, they are very simple, a diving board, not a complicated object, just a certain shape, but it has all kinds of implications. One of those 
forms on the internet channel on their time. Oh, I, I don't know what the process is. Okay. But I wasn't involved in I, I made the services, but I wasn't involved in the production of the to do the preparation of the standard. So again, the vision is to remain enable advancements in science and technology by offering access to folks who have creativity. And that is, if I were to summarize my whole presentation for the faculty and students, that's it. If you have an idea, all you need is a workshop in which to express that idea. If you wanted to paint your car, in a workshop, if you wanted to fix your car, you wanted to build a clock, whatever you want to do, you just need the right tool. Uh, my grandfather's a car company. So give anybody the right tools, they'll do a good job. So we offer the tools and we need your creativity and your imagination. Uh, we have state of the art equipment. And again, I don't want to hit everything and beat it up too badly. It's not going to make sense. But it's all the techniques of the semiconductor industry. I'm going to go over those very quickly. Uh, all kinds of buzzwords. But the bottom line is that we can do fabrication on a scale of single digit nanometers up to fingernail size. We can do deposition. We can do etching. We can do all the things, all the attendant processes, including and the measurement. So in one place, it's sort of catch-all. Again, I'll, I'll be delighted to go over the details later. We can do everything for making verniers. This is nothing more than a ruler. It's a pretty sophisticated ruler. We used to measure, uh, I think it was the size of dive bombs in wood pole. I don't remember the detail of that, but I remember the full power. Single level, we can do multiple levels with different things. This becomes uh, an electro uh, light graded junction, it's a brake junction. So uh, the idea is that you make a very narrow opening, and then you just take the whole wafer and you bend it. It cracks. Right? You ever made a cheesecake? It swells and cracks, and then when it comes back together again, it touches at one point first. So right away, you can take this brake junction, snap it, and then when you bring it back, you can have any dimension you want down to single digit nanometers. Again, it's a quick and easy way of making electrodes that are very close together. And then finally, you can get to this little device, this is the heart of it. This is an antenna. This is a sophisticated computing system. Any idea where you put this? Wait, I didn't tell you, right? No, I didn't tell you. You put that in the retina of the eye. Right behind the retina, you slide it between the retina and the optic nerve. And that has, uh, I forget the number, it's a couple hundred electrodes now. And they're all controlled by this, which is a sophisticated television set. And this is the antenna that brings in the signals from the In clinical tests in Europe, not here, but in clinical tests, folks who have been blind since birth can pick up different materials and they can pick up the object and handle the object that looks like the pixel array that's being produced in their, in their head. And they've never had vision in their life. So it's an interesting uh, attempt to engage in a biological implant of a high And then we have a group doing that right here in our laboratory. They've been doing it for, I think, about 12 or 15 years. It's a long term. So that's the extent of it. Something done is very simple that you can do in three days. Something that takes a couple of weeks to do multiple levels of integration that's so end up with some product. And then something that takes a long time, uh, but nevertheless can be rather relevant. Uh, our web page, NIN, which is the umbrella organization, and I happen to work at just one node. I'm not advertising the node, I'm advertising the technology, the concept of fundamental research appropriate to the technology. And our watchword, our versatility as opposed to the mantra of the CNSC, which would be reliability and productivity. So you have these two things that need to complement one another, and as I said, that's what the fundamental science is going to do. And again, when you look at it, it just seems natural to ally education with industry uh, with uh, government. Fabrication techniques are pretty straightforward. Uh, any idea how long these have been around? Image formation and pattern transfer? That's the 38,000 years. So I'd like to talk about just a few seconds about that. Uh, we work with the orderly process of layers of thin film. The silicon circuit that I passed around that uh, 300 millimeter wafer, that has 34 levels of functionality all stacked on one another. And each one has to be in the correct place. So that's about 35 layers of thin films. Uh, commercial electronic chip will have 30 plus. We do anything from one to as many as 50, depending on what people want. But every researcher controls their own research. So we have these specific characteristics. Uh, bottom up is this natural technology. Uh, more like DNA replication. Again, if you want to call this nanotechnology, it's fine, but it's a technology that produces you. It's just a template and an order array of constituent materials that then form uh, the functional device. Chemistry is 
looking at him, y'all made rock candy? Just say yes, even if it's a lie. Uh, top down is what we do, and this is like painting cars. When we've all painted cars, just say yes, even if it's a lie. Yes. <laughs> we've all painted cars, you want to paint red racing stripes on a yellow car, how do you do it? And fundamental, resist the fundamental. The template comes from masking tape, right? You make a masking tape, cover it on the yellow car, and you make a sand glass with it, move away the yellow paint, say yes, we do that. Yes. <laughs> and then that's the etching process, removal, and then you just spray red paint. Never done that, but it's a great story. It can also be extra class. People have been doing this for a long time. We use silicon wafers right now. This is the standard. The state of the art is 300, but as you mentioned in CNSE, they're going to 450. It's just an interesting fact that production can cost roughly the same amount of money to produce a wafer, regardless of whether it's the A wafer, which was that big, then it went to the B, then it went to the 2 inch, 3 inch, 4 inch, then it went to the 125 millimeter IBM always has the odd side. Then it went to the uh, 150 millimeter and this up and up. So those are the way. It's interesting. I love this picture because you have a couple of ton of silicon in a perfect crystal in a bowl that's hanging from a thread. That is the seed crystal right there. And it spins and it rotates in a bed of molten silicon. These pictures are amazing, but it's very much uh, magic. And no one is allowed in there. But that's the next question. You said a big, uh, big Rotating thumb full of molten silicon, you pick these things up. You start with chunks of, of polycrystal silicon. And then when you're done, you slice and dice it, and it gives us the way through. And then you're faced with the basic dichotomy of life, is that you never get it all at one time. In lithography, imaging materials are fragile, like masking tape, but they don't hold up well when you're zipping around the parking lot in your car. Okay. You need research materials that are robust, but lithographically inert. And again, how long have people known this? Because we talk about the genesis of technology. Say 1959. Well, no, 38,000 years ago. When you're making on this one. Oh, okay. So it's a two-step process. In reality, it's a four-step process because you always start with the concept, you always end with it didn't work. So I have to go back. And that's what sort of it is. And that's the history of it. Early materials are 35,000 years old. Uh, and, and with the cave paintings, they were using stucco, which is mud. Stucco, and they pattern, and they like it fine. They'll get out of it. Again, same thing with beeswax. They use leaves. The Fiji Islanders use leaves. If you use the grease from cooked animals, you make the pattern and you throw some kind of natural acid on it. Uh, this is your piece of wax or the glass that you can crack. So 38,000 years ago, we were making images of body parts using technology. We've now advanced to the point where we now make images of body parts with zero emissions. Yeah. We're moving along. Simple 
things. This is contact print. Can you do film that ancient technology talk to that? No. Well, this is what goes for contact print, put the negative on top of the printing paper and see what it looks like. Uh, you get a straightforward exposure. These things are pretty cheap and easy, but they only print out to a thousand nanometers, give or take. So again, quick, cheap, easy, not necessarily good. You've heard the old story, right? You get pick one or two. But if you don't get quick, cheap, easy, it's good. This is down to a thousand nanometers. Don't worry, still back to carbon light. 
make the next smaller thing, what are they going to say? Light. Optics forever. They're down to 22 nanometers. They're taking a 193 nanometer light source and they're printing 22 nanometers and they demonstrate that they can print 15. 15 nanometers with a light that is 193 nanometers. They do a lot of tricks and they're painful tricks and they're expensive tricks, but they work. So the nano the photo engineers will tell you optics forever and then everybody who has an axe to grind will grind it. So the EV people will say, oh no, direct writing. It's the only Yeah, 
deposition or chemical. Uh, successful deposition requires you just a little while what's coming on. So, so this is what some of them look like. This is a nice coating of aluminum on top of the photography. This is the lift-off process. And essentially, that's our line. From here to here is our line. And we arranged the resist to have a little bit of an undercut, which was actually good. So when the aluminum comes onto the surface, some of it in here, the rest of it flows down and lands on the surface. And now when I wash this resist away,
the fundamental question is what can nanotechnology do for you? The fundamental answer is I don't know. But I can show you what it's done and some of the evolutionary processes that have developed these techniques, and then you can uh, decide for yourself. It's not as far as we discussed before, you want to address a research opportunity or a funding opportunity or a creation opportunity. So we make sure Folks who are not interested in nanotechnology to start thinking about underwriting for 30 days. Nanotechnology is wonderful because you can make little guitars. The story is this was done by a lonely graduate student. He was on his way to a Beans conference, which was back in Rome for a couple of weeks. But uh, they always had a pretty picture contest and he wanted to win it. So he was looking at vibrating systems. He was looking at beam vibration because he was trying to make an artificial cochlea. And for an artificial cochlea, all you do is get resonators at different frequencies, and the frequencies determine by the thickness, the height, and the Young models and all that. So he was building beams, and all he had to do was anchor the beam at one end and anchor to the other. And at the same time, he was thinking of his guitar or strumming his ear guitar or whatever he did. You know, he said, Why don't I make a guitar? And he made this. Uh, by the way, he didn't want a guitar, he wanted a heart. He wanted a bunch of different beams. But he made this, he submitted it, he won the pretty picture contest. And this came out in one of the money magazines or something, one of the uh, technology nano but it struck a chord because people said, this is possible. This was done when, I don't remember, sometime around the realization that nanotechnology was going to be way in the future. Uh, and so this is what he really wanted, which he made in the fall of the week. But now he's looking at different ones. And notice what we, when I talk about an undercut, this is what we do. We put multiple levels down. So if we want this particular device, we have silicon, we have silicon oxide, we have silicon nitride. We define the beam, and then we etch through the nitride into the oxide. We pick a liquid that will dissolve the oxide but not touch the beam. So now we dissolve away the oxide, which means the beam is now free to move. And we put it in another liquid, which heats out the silicon, and now you have a beam pit. These things can now bounce back and forth and do whatever they want. Simple process, just like painting a car, but it has interesting implications because if you break this off and dissolve away all that, what you have are resonant devices that can sit proudly in an ear and vibrate. And if a sound comes through, the then it will couple right there. The auditory nerve is running this way. And so now you get an immediate coupling into the auditory nerve. It's exactly the same thing that the eardrum and the various bones do. And now you have biofunctionality with a piece of silicon. So that kind of is uh, his goal. And this is just a quick way of talking about it. Uh, this was done in 2000. This was done right after. Anybody right now? Here's where we data. Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton. He was he played the saxophone, and so this was one of our earlier demonstrations. We were contracted to do this, and what we made, can you see this? It is the light. You see what they want? So we made a, a guitar, and we want to say, well, the president plays saxophone. Why not make that? This is what we get all the time, by the way. We say, we made A, and they say, we don't like A, we made the C. And so we charge you that our way to do that. But we made, I forget how many, hundreds of thousands. It says 287,900, plus the few messages. So you can put atoms where they belong at the rate of a couple an hour. And now you want to build a U 
human or a creature, even a creature that eats human. It's going to take you a long time. And so this kind of technology is great for showpiece, functionality is interesting, but again, the capability of moving into the lab and putting them where they where you want is possible. So I've already shown you a few fundamental things. Now, maybe you start making things out of carbon monoxide and quantum canals, quantum corrals are incredible. These are not just standard uh, surface texture. These are quantum mechanical waves. And so these are uh, wave functions that exist because of the cumulative nature of all these uh, atoms put in them. So they're fantastic. And again, each one of these is the product of many, many hours of painstaking work because by the time you get it almost done, one of the atoms decides it had a little too much thermal energy, wiggles away and knocks it through out and you start all over again. So I wasn't joking about erase and start again. Process engineer behind our eyes, there is pain because they're always throwing away what you've done. You can take carbon nanotubes and with a tip you can move them. And again, these are just a few experiments to show you what can be done on a fundamental level. Then you start talking about upgrading to different sizes. But you can actually move carbon nanotubes, the arrow point to where this thing is just moved back and touched by a tip under very good control. You have to see a transistor, this is at the fundamental level. So this is the gate, this is the drain, this is the source, that is the insulator, and the electrons go that way. So what you this is just a quarter micron gate, 250 nanometers. So this was ancient technology. It's a great demonstration. Minor voltage here, no current flow, but it controls the current that flows from being the source. Obviously, there's a load in there somewhere. Any electrical engineers? If they're electrical engineers, I won't try to pretend I know what I'm talking about. Okay, no way. But that's it. So it's compound. That's another variation of it. These are the fundamental units of switching. A gate, a source, and a drain. Gates fan out. One gate, or one signal can trigger many millions of gates, and now you get connectivity. So with 10 switches, you can say it is now Wednesday or not Wednesday, Monday or not Monday, Tuesday or not Tuesday. I am in Belgium, I am not in Belgium. Okay. The more dots you have, the more complex your signal can be. So now you can get a signal that says, now, yes, I am in Brussels. I am getting a cup of coffee. I have now, etc., etc. Don't be bored. Uh, that man has given us that technology. And now I want to show some fun things in bio. Why? 
completely separated auditory nerves, we don't have the ability to zero in. This fly does. This fly has a head that's only about three millimeters wide, and it has an ear that finds, if it hears a cricket, it flies directly to the cricket, because the, it's the Buddha said, right? The fly is going for its meal. The cricket is just going for a run. Um, the fly goes directly to the cricket, lands on it, and obviously consumes it for its uh, for its egg. And the way it does that is with a phased hearing, not necessarily a, a intensity hearing, right? We hear by intensity. If this is louder than that, we assume it comes from over there. But this picks up phase, and so it can fly through the air the right to the cricket. We're modeling that. And again, there's this unnamed customer who would like to hear to be able to identify the location from which an impact sound comes from. Any idea what kind of impact sounds there are? sound, a clack, a click, a boom, a weapon, weapon, gunshots. So you can translate this into a microphone that gives the direction of a gunshot. So you put it up these in the city. Remember, London has enough cameras to take a picture a hundred times if you want to watch. You put these things on a pole and you know immediately the location of a gunshot. Okay. Oh, interesting. Uh, I'm giving you concepts. This took several years to develop, but it's based on the fly, and it's based on this vibrating membrane that picks, is very sensitive to the phase of the, uh, of the telehearth signal. Uh, this is an interesting one. 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 1993, 20 years ago, Rose Clark was interested in looking at the products that were given off by a cell that were stimulated. And unfortunately, she found that if you stimulated the cell, it would give off products, but in order to keep the cell alive, you had to have it in a saline solution. And now the products just diffuse very quickly. So our question was, how do we define a cell, but keep it alive at the same time? Uh, dry dock. Right? It's made them well. A cereal bowl big enough for the cell to fit in. She threw the cells down, squeegeed them off in a very crude way, and every once in a while a cell would nestle in very nicely into the hole. Then she could, you can see this happening right here. This is the probe that stimulates it, and this is the pipe that pulls off the products. Signal to noise ratio went up marvelously because now all the products that were ejected by the cell were now found. So she could look at them and she could look at electrochemical she can see how stimulation will affect cells, what products they get out. Fundamental basic biological knowledge. So now we ratchet forward 20 years. And we ratchet forward 20 years and we get to ZMW, zero mode wave value. And this is based on some very interesting physics, and that is the physics of the evanescent wave. If you have a laser coming through here, the laser will penetrate into an opening, but only far enough depending on the width of the opening. So the smaller this cross-section, the less the laser will be radiated in. That's fundamental physics 101. They developed the process, this is all developed in our laboratories, right? They developed the process to anchor a transcription enzyme right there. And they anchor only one time. Then they take all the bases that are used as constituents for DNA and they uh, add fluorophores. So they dye them in different colors. So now this transcription enzyme sits the waveguide. It's bathed in this laser light, which is a uh, proprietary amount. And now, whenever it replicates DNA, as it makes DNA, it grabs an A, it grabs a B, it grabs a C, it grabs a D, I think it letters right, you know what I mean. Every time it grabs a constituent of the DNA, that fluorophore is released, the laser picks up, and so you have now a supercomputer looking at millions of these things at the same time, putting together sections of your DNA. And then eventually, as it's doing that, it's trying to match them all up, and then give you a long sequence, which is you. And it can do that in an hour for a thousand dollars, give or take. And so again, you look at the evolution. In 1993, we were just anchoring a cell and looking at the chemicals that come off. Now we're anchoring transcription enzymes. You take a drop of your blood in vivo. Uh, you're doing this within an hour. So it's an incredible tool uh, for diagnostics. Again, the question is, what of what value is this information? It would be a great value.
estimate it will take you so long and cost you so much money. In terms of synthesis or development or process flow, uh, you would give us materials. We would then negotiate with you. You would say you want to make it out of silicon carbide, and we would say, well, can we can we call your silicon carbide and raise you to silicons? And then you would say, well, maybe silicon would be cheaper, etc. So the, the sifting group, we, we do this every Monday or every Wednesday, uh, and we will entertain phone calls and we do all kinds of suggestions. Uh, there's there's a group. Our task is to give you an idea of the expectation, you know, what it will cost you in terms of time, money, frustration, how many swear words you'll have to do before you can. But we need from you a concept. Now, the intellectual concept is yours. You, you can say, for example, the vibrating device. People make those. Some people make those, and they put them in concrete. And all they do is attach this thing to a, to a piezo drive for energy and a radio that says, hey, that's it. You put them in the concrete. And you come along every couple of weeks, and you, you flash at it, you say hello, and if it says hello back, you know it's there. All right? If you put 10,000 of them in a bridge, and all of a sudden one week you come along, and there are only 3,000 of them left, you say, where did the other 7,000 go? Should I start to worry whether the bridge is going to fall apart? And that actually is a, a dark project, a public transportation project, that we have people working on right now. Another group will take this thing, and they'll put that little dot at the end that I showed you before. They put that tiny little dot at the end, and then they put it, they functionalize it. So they dip it in magic fluid B. And it sits there in the subways of New York. There is a very famous explosive residue that everyone loves. The bad people and the good people. So they functionalize this to light that explosive residue. If you ever watch a diving board, it's sort of cool. A small person comes on and it shakes, and then a large person comes on and shakes. And then every person makes it shake at a different rate. Well, with this thing, you have a laser shining on it. And it vibrates, and if you're sitting there fine, if you go walking past it with explosives residue on your clothing, which, by the way, is very difficult to get out of your clothing, very difficult to get out of your body. If you work around explosives, you, you exude this constantly. So you walk by, and within seconds, this machine has responded to that explosive residue, and you don't get through the next gate. These are employed in various subway systems, in, 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 well, let's just say around the world. That's as far as I can say. But that was the same fundamental structure. Another person is taking that fundamental structure and asking whether or not you have the presence of a particular bacteria. So they functionalize it to a macro molecule. This thing is down to 100 zeptograms resolution. So you can put a 3 to 10 nanometer dot of gold at the end of this and you can find out whether or not it responds mechanically to the presence of a macro molecule of 100 zeptograms. So your research concept is what influences we don't want to attack it. There's a question before about intellectual property. The answer is we don't want it. We're not interested in it. We don't care. We're interested in you and developing the thing you want. So if you came and said you want a diving board, we'd make you a diving board. We would help you make your own diving board. If then you said you wanted to functionalize it, you wanted to put some mechanical device on it, there's a person who comes from uh, Maine, and now it's Rochester, and it's a commercial product, but he does exactly the same thing as a diving board. And all it says is sit there. And again, there's a piezo and a yellow. Every time it bends, it generates a certain amount of power. And the functional level here for the cloud is 150 microwatts. So at 150 microwatts, this thing just sits there and shakes. If it generates 150 microwatts, it's enough energy to send out a radio signal that says, I'm alive, and the motor I'm sitting on is sitting at 100 degrees centigrade. And it just sits there, and every few minutes, it sends out a signal that tells you that the ones in the concrete tell you that they're still alive. The ones here tell you the temperature. There's a whole variation of them, and all this one does is just generate electricity. Right? A truck in Chicago moves, and this thing will generate electricity in Zurich. That's how sensitive they are, but they just sit and vibrate. So energy harvest, the same device can be an energy harvester, it can be a functional, a very sensitive chemical sensor, or it can be a very sensitive uh, detector. And it can do that just by the definitions that you impose on it. Uh, in terms of getting into the lab, I want to just address that. Yes, uh, it's real easy, just give us a call, because we will look at your project. We don't want to know uh, what you're planning on doing with it if we want to sell it to. What we'll tell you is if you have this concept and you want to make this device, if you make it out of the materials that you know. And I keep going back to the semiconductor industry because they've done all the work. Right? You say silicon carbide, silicon nitride, silicon polysilicon resist. We know those things. We know paraline, we know PDMS, we know these things. If you say you want it out of aluminum carbonate, we don't know them. And so now you have to do that around your yourself. But, but essentially it takes you less than a week to find out whether or not your project is feasible. 
And if so, how much it will cost and how long it will take. As I said, there are a few people who have some experience in counseling. Each of the 14 um, labs or facilities have specializations? Yes. Or, yes. So would you refer someone if it's a materials project and it's not something that Absolutely. you would just yeah. automatically? There, there is a network analysis committee, and then each node has its own analysis. say 
hey, what are the opportunities? They are whatever people resonate with. We were talking at lunch today about uh, one of the people in our lab who was what I consider to be uh, the best uh, teacher and coordinator of etching technology. He started out repairing old cars, rebuilding vintage cars. I was going to say junk, but that's too cars. Vintage cars. From there, he got into high precision welding. From welding, he got into high precision vacuum systems. From there, he got into etching. And it was his inclination curiosity and his imagination that got that going. So I would argue that, as with the network, if you expose folks to this technology, it might resonate. So when you say, uh, is there opportunity, I mean, uh, Global Crossings has thousands of jobs that are available to folks who can speak and talk. And so you spend two weeks working with a program that, that essentially gets you in the lab. And I wasn't joking. In two weeks, you can really understand the rudiments of the technology and how you implement it. So you get groups. And It's interesting, he's 
not, when you see the trampoline, you think it does this, right? It bounces like a trampoline. It doesn't. He's adapting it as a planar oscillator. It swings back and forth like this. And it has a very interesting resonance and it can be used to detect something. Again, I can't really say, I don't know. But uh, it, it resonates this way. And so it's this beautiful device that you can shake and you can throw around and it becomes a sensor. And that developed from a pro program that we did. They got funding. The, the issue, as I said, so the funding came from a federal program as well as their university. And to bring uh, tenor, I think they brought 12 students in. They had the idea, we, we researched ahead of time, we had the masks, we had a lot of the, the groundwork done for them. But they came in, there were lab fees to be paid, they paid them, there was a cooperative program. As I said, when you wrap this up in the educational opportunities, you can get an awful lot of support and an awful lot done with